Okay. Hello. Is that, yeah, that's good. Uh, there's a slide in a minute that will say a little bit about me, but um, I work at Queen Mary University of London. Uh, I'm the director of the Centre for Digital Music there, and um, I've been there for just over 20 years. So I've been doing a lot of thinking over the last two, three years of, around the whole idea of the rise of AI, and I'm going to share some of those thoughts with you today, but um, that's not all I'll be talking about. Um, so I'm going to get my apologies in first. So one of the one of the things that you realize is that everybody wants to talk about AI. Um, and um, so maybe I shouldn't, but uh, it, it's very much a bandwagon. And for me, that is a good reason to try to start explaining what's not so great about having a bandwagon that people um, jump blindly onto. So, yeah, and in some ways, uh, when I, in fact, just observe my own students, uh, I think this bandwagon is running out of control a bit. So a little bit of thought is uh, a reflection is, is timely. Um, so these are personal thoughts. I'm starting to share them with colleagues at Queen Mary and, and elsewhere, but, you know, they're not entirely well formed. Um, and I, I look forward to having some conversations. For, for if you if you if you disagree with me, that'll be great. It's, well, it's probably better if you agree with me, but uh, and, and help, help me um, along my journey. But uh, a little bit of uh, discussion and debate is a good thing. Um, but I'm going to start with some questions for you. Um, you might want to raise your hand. You might not want to. Um, so, who's heard of deep learning? That's good. <laughs> Who has used it for audio? Just a much smaller number for those of you uh, who are being live streamed if you can't see. Um, who's used it for web audio? I, it's slightly even fewer. So there's three, four, five maybe hands in the, in the room. Um, who thinks they understand deep learning? <laughs> yeah, some maybes and... Yeah, uh, and then who thinks, I don't care if I don't really understand it, I'm going to use it anyway. Yes, that's <laughs> that's my point, I think. Um, I could stop here. Um, but first, I'm going to give a, just be, because, um, I don't know, really, I just thought I'd do it, give a personal historical context for what I've done in web audio. And I, I don't really think of myself at all as a web audio person, actually. Um, although uh, I was very honored to to be the chair for the, I think it was the third one in 2017. It all seems a very long time ago. Um, so I'll say a little bit about, you know, my, my own, very little bit about my own perspective on, on web and audio as I interpret it. Uh, I'll show you some videos and demos of some of the outcomes from a large project I ran, which supported uh, WAC in, in London. Uh, and then I'll get to this, this potentially more pro provocative material. So uh, I could ask another question here, but I was my my my, my sort of uh, habitual way of doing a presentation is to have no imagery, and I realised that's a bit boring. And so I then looked things up on the web to find a picture, and I found this to go with web audio. And and actually, it's the uh, it's the logo we used in London. I'd forgotten it existed, but it does. Uh, right in the top left has the name of the person who created the imagery. Um, so back when I was an undergraduate in electronic engineering, computer science was just about existed, but um, there was no internet, but there was ARPANET and DARPANET. Um, I did my PhD in digital audio power amplifiers, and my experience with the web there, so to speak, was using dial-up, and I can't even remember how slow it was, but it was probably around a few hundred bode, that was the word for it, um, bits per second, um, to access mainframes when I wasn't going in to the university. Unix was there and there were emails. But the, the, the connection between audio and this very nascent internet was a long, long way uh, from coming together. Um, in the late 90s, I was uh, part of a project funded by BT, which was 
then called British Telecom, um, that you know the major telecom provider at the time in the UK, and they funded a project with lots of universities on video conferencing, and we contributed some scalable audio codecs to that, and that led to me founding um, a startup uh, where we were trying to sell the technology, and it was really clever technology. Uh, you could really to the to the nearest bit per second or whatever uh, you could determine what the bit rate was and it would always decode and you could create um, packet loss compensation and we showed this to all sorts of VCs and one after another they said this is great technology but where's the business model and of course our business model was the wrong one but Spotify had the right idea uh, and uh, yeah the rest is history um, Around the same time, um, and I think this was perhaps even more um, uh, more influential on me, I, I was at the AES in Los Angeles, uh, and there was um, a concert at um, University of Southern California, and the band was in McGill University in Canada, and all the different instruments, all the mic feeds were being streamed, I forget what the what the technology was called, but anyway, it was like two gigabits a second or something, it was being streamed to LA and then mixed into surround sound. And I thought, wow, you know, this is, this is definitely a really important um, development. And uh, also around the same time, uh, I came across Chris Chafe's work. And um, if I remember rightly, we invited Chris Chafe as a keynote to London, his work in Soundwire. Um, which basically uses the delays in the internet as the c components in signal processing um, systems. And again, I was I was really thrown by that. I thought it was brilliant. Uh, and so the penny dropped really that for me um, that I realised that audio would be the future of audio was absolutely connected with the internet and the web. Um, and uh, yeah, and the two were were sort of linked together for for the rest for the continuation of my research so the web this this image is from chris chafe's um actually I, I don't know if you can read it but uh the the, the url is come from says net acoustics research uh, i don't actually know what that diagram means um i could make some guesses there's a feedback loop in it um but it doesn't really matter it's just the eye candy so these are the sort of things that um I think uh, think of when I think about web and audio, so streaming and download, clearly, but much, much more obviously uh, processing in the browser and synthesis in the browser. One of my colleagues at Queen Mary is doing quite a lot uh, in um, sound effect synthesis in the browser. Um, for me, the, the routine was um, linked audio data uh, and applying logic to that to, to, oops, to generate um, audio knowledge. Um, so the semantic web, basically. Uh, and then um, from Chris Chafe's work, the whole concept of, of the web as an audio device and the, this idea of uh, internet acoustics. Um, and then looking forward, this you know must include AI, machine learning, deep learning, because for good or for bad, uh, it is everywhere these days, um, sometimes unnecessarily so. Uh, but yeah, it's there. It's gonna it's gonna be with us for some while, and uh, probably already does include those. Um, but maybe the next thing uh, that we're going to be looking at is the metaverse. As as awkward as I find that word, uh, and when I used it with colleagues the other week, they all thought I was talking about Meta and Facebook. None of them had actually. Um, concluded that there was anything more to the metaverse than that one company, which I thought was strange. Um, anyway, so that's my that's my uh, very brief run through web audio. So, uh, and it was brief, I hope. So, so a, a few of the AI outcomes from this large project um, that I ran um, up till 2019. So um, there is just the four of them. Um, this web connected guitar, uh, which I, I was fascinated by, not from Queen Mary. Um, and then, uh, fingers crossed that the internet works, a little um, run through music links, 
which supports music discovery, um, the, our Grateful Dead Explorer, Grateful Dead Live, and a little bit of aspects of studio production as well. Um, but what was the project about, just briefly? Um, it did fund or cut part fund uh, WAC in, in 2017. It was a long project supported by the UK government, it involved three universities led by Queen Mary. Uh, quite a few companies got involved, especially the BBC. Um, and we had three main questions. I've only put two of them here. One was, can next generation web technologies combined with music content analysis bring new value and functionality to producers, creators, consumers, and intermediaries of music content? So it was really trying to look across the whole of the music industry. Uh, it was well funded by projects terms of about six million pounds but i'm sure if you really think about it to try and change all of those things across the whole of the music industry uh it was a drop in the ocean to, to only have that that amount of money um and then we we were looking at how the the two ends of the value chain may benefit so both um in music production and music consumption what what sort of behaviors would change but the focus was on metadata, essentially, was on linked data. That was the, the hypothesis, was that using semantic web technologies would take things a leap forward. Um, hidden in amongst that, by the way, was the fact, really, that uh, those technologies um, support uh, symbolic, symbolic AI. So there was AI in it. I just didn't really think about it that way. So this is the Carolan guitar. And... I don't know how clearly you can see it, um, but the, the guitar is uh, covered in, in um, embellishments, and they look kind of Celtic. Um, they're called art codes, and this, this was designed at Nottingham University, our colleagues. They had this guitar built, and these aren't just these aren't just um, these aren't just design. Sorry, they aren't just artistic. They are designed, and they are essentially QR codes basically. So each one is unique. It's designed to have a certain binary code associated with it, and it links to some source of information on the web. So it's this, it's this bridge between the, the analog world of a or the physical world, essentially, of a, a guitar um, and the history that can be recorded about it. And so if you look up Carolan guitar, uh, you will find a web page um, with dozens, maybe a hundred entries or more uh, that record the history of this guitar and its use. And one of those uses is the CD, which has got its own art code um, uh, and, and again links to some more information. So um, my colleague, my ex-colleague, Steve Benford at Nottingham is the guy, if you really think this is brilliant, which I do, but if you can work with it somehow, the project's, his, this part of the project continues. Um, so we, uh, right, I'm going to move into a slightly strange way of, of uh, writing my, my text here. So for those of you who know the semantic web, it's built of triplets, and all of my little bullet points here are composed as triplets, um, subject, verb, object, essentially. So music link uses the semantic web. Uh, the semantic web links information. These, this linked information enables journeys and the journeys enable discovery. Um, and what I'm going to try and do now is uh, find one I prepared earlier, but just before it goes wrong, in case it goes wrong, um, Fela Kuti is an African musician. Uh, we have a little pane here which plays 30-second snippets from Deezer, um, but, and, and some more sources of information, BBC Music, YouTube, and... Uh, uh, Wikipedia and so, um, yeah, uh, Music Brains, that's the other one. Um, but the main uh, sort of interaction for a person, all of these blobs is represent each one, sorry, represents an artist who is similar in some way to, uh, in this case, Fela Kuti. Kuti um, and the color coding uh, tells you in which, in which modality they are similar. So it might be nationality, 
but we included, or it might be uh, some physical um, aspect. Uh, we dis we discovered. Um, I should have known it, I guess, but I discovered that Ella Fitzgerald was an amputee by by uh, chasing through the links here um, because she was similar to uh, the Def Leppard drummer whose name escapes me. But we also include some of our acoustic features as ways to, to generate similarities between artists. So I'll see if that works. Uh, no, it doesn't. I'll do this instead. Um, Here's, yeah, here's the one I prepared earlier, if that is going to work. And uh, we've had some trouble with the internet. But what should happen if... Um, I, won't, I won't spend too long on this in case it doesn't really work, but we should see all those little um, bubbles, essentially, pop up from the bottom of the screen into, into a linked graph. But clearly it's not quite working as it should. Oh, you, th you think, yeah. Oh yes, it's not on there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it switched to the. It switched. Ah, oh, de Michel. Got it. Yeah, it switched automatically to the. <laughs> to the local Wi-Fi. I didn't spot that. Uh, yeah, here we go. Uh, that's that. That's a bit more promising. Um, this does get built on the fly, so you know. Uh, okay, there we go. And thank you, Michelle. There's something a bit crazy going on. It's not normally going to do that. And we might have to um, abandon this as an idea. But in principle, so I'm hovering over this artist whose name I can't completely read, Screamers something. And right at the bottom, it says similar artists by rhythm. And if I go to this one here, uh, some band called TV on the radio, I guess, similar artists by tonality. Uh, out. No, whoops, that doesn't work. Uh, it normally works in Safari, but anyway, I th what I will do is I'll move on, um, and if if there's time at the end, we can we can have a look. But um, so uh, here's a stable image, um, but it. We, we've, we've, all sorts of people find this very interesting, uh, but nobody's actually decided to try and commercialize it in any way. So uh, it's still sitting there. If you think uh, it could be of interest in a project of yours, do talk to me. Um, so uh, another aspect that we worked on um, for uh, mainly because there's a lot of data available um, was uh, the to, to bring under one umbrella the the various um, various collections around the Grateful Dead, starting from the Internet Archive, um, because that holds, I guess, quite a few people have heard of the Internet Archive and and, and the the music repository there, the live recordings. So um, the Grateful Dead has put a lot of money into that. And um, anyway, so back into my triplets, uh, the Grateful Dead is a band. They played gigs, they allowed recordings. In fact, they encouraged recordings. Um, uh, has fans, the fans collect memorabilia, and we built the Grateful Dead Live. Um, now, what I, this maybe should work, because uh, I'm gonna go to a video. Um, but just before I do, what we're able to see here, um, for this particular concert in 1978, in Jackson, Mississippi, um, is some imagery of the city, an image of the venue, of a ticket, of a poster, the weather, uh, the set list, the band, and then this music player here, um, and with each recording. And there are one of the features of the collection on on, on the uh, the Internet Archive is that there will be many recordings of the gig by different amateurs and, and a professional recording too, typically. And you can listen to any of those. And at the bottom is a timeline that helps you navigate through um, the gigs. But let's see what happens. Uh, some of you might recognize Thomas. Uh, he, he was part, he, so he did this work along with um, a couple of others. Um, but he also was one of the co-organizers in, in London. 
Um, this is him talking. We held a, an industry day um, where we invited uh, about 100 people to come along. We, we booked Vast Expense Abbey Road Studios, not that you can tell, uh, and we'll see what happens if we can hear. All right. No, we can't hear him. Is there any way to... Uh, let me just... Industry day demonstration at uh, Abbey Road Studios, and um, uh, this is our project about the Grateful Dead I'm doing with... Uh, uh, yeah, and it actually demonstrates how you can use the semantic web to bring all the red flag concepts into one place. And um, as you might know, there are thousands of recordings of the Grateful Dead, and there are several uh, uh, websites which collect all kinds of things about the Grateful Dead tickets, posters. The Internet Archive has all these thousands of recordings, so what we're doing here, you can select the recording. And we use new data to link to the locations, the venues. You can see the tickets and posters of a certain uh, concert. And also we have historical weather data, so you can actually see what the weather was like at a particular concert. Here we use the Internet Archive to actually stream the concerts. There are multiple recordings of one concert, which you can select here. And then you will see here some information about the lineage. Now, what's nice is that we also link to the set lists of that concert, and you can actually then say, I really like this song here, Big River. Where did they play it also? So I get here, I just, it makes a query, and I can see where did they play this song. When I click here, I go to Phoenix, I can see the venue, and I might actually want to look here, where did they play it also in the venue? The other functionality, this is a, a, a prototype, what we're working towards is also that we analyze the audio and you can select a song and then the system will automatically make this collage of one song. So this will now select versions of the song Good Lover from 1966 to 1995, or 1965 to 1995, and we'll make this stream of music out of these 30 years of music and we'll also retrieve uh, these artifacts uh, from the concerts in so real time. It's one song. It's one song over 30 years, over 30 years. which has been condensed or been cut together. Well, exactly, it to plays a single number. Exactly, it plays eight to 16 bars. We uh, set it here to, um, and you can kind of see the evolution of the song basically over their career. We have a little listen on uh, uh, it, should, on the it should work, yes. Yes, so it's got the earphones to the yeah. So this is basically, and how did you put it in together? We analyzed the audio, and it will in real time. It will choose um, the the transition points between the songs that we can get. We automatically get a somewhat uh, a nice transition between the songs, so the fade in and fade out, and we also use them. Some uh, tempo analysis to make these transitions better and uh, um, yeah, make the computer choose the right versions. Excellent, excellent. Your name is Thomas, Thomas Wimmery. And the project is? is uh, it's the Great Wooded Concert Explorer. Uh, and the Vice Chair and the Everett Studios. And it's in the first industry. Thanks, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think I'll skip this one, actually. Um, I'll just say a few words. We, we also have applied uh, some AI tools to studio technology. So th this demo, just in the, in the interest of time, really. Um, we'll what? Oh, no, no, that, that, is, the ca that is as it's captured. <laughs> yeah, I know, it's a bit confusing. Um, it, it should, yeah. Um, well, actually, I'd, I will show you. Um, yeah, here we go. So I'll, I'll do it very quickly. The idea is you, you bring in an unknown audio clip, you ask it to recognize what the instrument is, and then ask it to extract features where it's decided what feature extractor to use based on the instrument. Um, and so that's a guitar and um, recognizes the guitar. And then it says, so that's it, that's identify instrument. And it probably it currently says just at the top of that audio source it says, but it should say something. Else. And then feature labels is gonna um, it extracts the underlying um, the key. 
Um, this demo continues to, with a drum and then a saxophone, and obviously with the drum it extracts rhythm features. So this was done not in the web, uh, not in the web browser, uh, but but clearly could be adapted to do that. So um, I'll just stop there. So a little intermediate summary, intermediate in in the sense of this talk um, about. The project it wasn't ever conceived as an AI project but the world changed um, we start, it was the proposal was written in 2013 by 2015 deep learning was a thing came okay, suddenly hit me I didn't, didn't hadn't expected um, but we were already using some of the techniques without really even knowing it um, it relied on uh, bridging between stati statistical machine learning not necessarily deep learning um, and um, symbolic logic, for, which derives from the, 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 the form of the special form of the metadata we were using. As I said, deep learning came in about halfway. And what, what we, the, the way the whole project worked was uh, to have uh, these targeted probes. These we called them demonstrators. There were twenty to thirty of them. I forget exactly how many. You've just looked at four, uh, four of the bigger ones. Some of them weren't as big as that. Uh, to explore problem areas of relevance and then kind of try and put the big picture together. I have to say that we, we, we never really did that bit quite as well as we, we could have done the big picture part. Um, but that's the nature of funding, isn't it? You move on to the next thing without necessarily pulling everything together the way uh, you might. Um, so I'm now going to move on to the, the second part of the the, the talk really. So what is it about all this AI anyway? Um, I thought because here we are, the web audio uh, conference where which proposes doing audio in, in the browser, I should I thought I'd better check if there was anything about doing deep learning in the browser. And um, yes, I found quite a, a few a few websites, but this particular one, which has got a link there, uh, provides this is just one, one little aspect of it, provides this overview of what was available um, just over a year ago. Presumably, um, there's more now. So there's quite a few. They're all in a JavaScript. Um, actually, I'm not sure about the one from Tokyo. But there, so that if, you, if you wanted to, um, you could presumably learn how to integrate some aspects of deep learning into your into your web audio. Um, that's just because I thought we should see what was out there. Um, I'm going to start my uh, exploration, if you like, of the state of deep learning research um, with what, to me, at least most of the features of a typical audio deep learning research process. And at the top right, uh, you see uh, somebody's impression of a variational autoencoder, uh, but it doesn't really matter uh, what it is. Um, it's just a bit of eye candy again. Um, so the first thing you do is you find a data set and you need some ground truth. Normally you need some ground truth anyway. You choose a specific architecture, which might be a transformer, or it might be an autoencoder or a convolutional neural network or whatever. Um, and currently, what is super trendy are transformers. Um, Google has released, was it Google or Facebook? Anyway, and then there's the OpenAI uh, version. So large companies are releasing these trained networks, and transformers are the ones that are the, the biggest. And obviously, biggest is best. Um, you decide your input format. So what is it that the network works on? Is it on the raw audio in some way, or the raw, de the raw signal? Or is it a transformed version of it? So quite often, rather than the spectrum, it'll be the MEL spectrum or MFCCs. You choose a training regime and a loss function, um, and a few other things as well. Uh, choose the optimizer, probably. Uh, how many layers there are, how big each one is, uh, what the framework is that you should use. Is it PyTorch or something else? Then you split the data set into training, probably validation as well, and testing. And quite often you use, um, I've said F, fold. F is for 
fold to some number, like tenfold or fivefold validation, where you uh, randomly chop it up into, say, five subsets or whatever it is, and just keep one for, for the testing. Then you run experiments for hours or days. And then finally, what you do is you evaluate against the ground truth and generate a very small table of statistics that prove absolutely that by 0.5 of a percent, your approach is the state of the art this week. Um, there's a certain, I hope you can detect the sense of irony in my voice or, uh, about some of this. Um, in most of the papers I've read and reviewed uh, from all sorts of conferences, most of these stages are never explained. All the rationale behind the choices is never explained. And that seems to me not to be particularly good science. Anyway, so what could possibly go wrong? Well, here's a few things. The quality of the data set doesn't actually seem to matter to many people. What matters is how big it is. Um, and equally, the quality and reliability of the ground truth doesn't really seem to matter. As long as one person has annotated it, that's typically considered to be enough. Um, have you checked for bias? Uh, I know in the US, and it's, a, it's about to happen in the UK, that uh, facial recognition is using AI-based techniques is going to be banned. I suspect the EU is going to do something s similar uh, because of the inherent bias in these algorithms. Of course, in audio, it, it's not quite so serious if you, if you have bias. It doesn't matter that to, to the world if you... Um, if, if, uh, you uh, recognize um, one chord wrongly. It, it, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a good particular um, issue. But, it, but in other aspects, other applications of deep learning, it certainly is. What's the hypothesis being tested? And I'll come back to the idea of hypothesis, uh, which um, is, it, it is a concept that seems to have disappeared. It's a um, research question seems to have taken over from the idea of hypothesis, certainly in, in the in the Anglo world. Um, pick the most fashionable architecture and squeeze your problem onto it. That seems to happen. Transformers are very good for sequence to sequence mapping, typically language translation, and yet people will try and use it for anything. Now these networks are so big with so many parameters that they will do a decent job at almost anything, but that really isn't science in, in my view. It's not, it's not thoughtful research. Um, have you got enough data for this particular size of network? Or maybe that should be the other way around. Is the network the right size for the amount of data? Will you overfit? Have you got an appropriate loss function? Again, as I said, you don't see much justification of this. Um, I particularly worry about the reliability of using other people's libraries. I think the very large ones have been well tested, but quite often, um, people will use a, a library they find on, on the web. It hasn't been validated by anyone. It's, it's almost certainly got bugs in it. Um, and yet, uh, they're used sort of blindly to, to generate results. Um, is your test set truly representative of the actual problem you're, you're dealing with? Will you overfit? Um, because the, the training and data, sorry, the, the training and test sets are cover pretty much the same. Um, ground. Actually, just going back to that, one of the, well, I, I didn't put this as a bullet point, one, one of the thing that's often cited is generalizability in these, in these networks, in these architectures, and I think that's, a, uh, that's worthy of question too, uh, because quite often, um, by being much more specific, by, be, by being um, controlling in, for example, the environment in which audio is captured. If you're only going to do um, AI in the recording studio, you really don't need to have your test set um, including recordings in ambient noise as well, for example. So generalizability is not necessarily one of the most important uh, aspects of AI. It can be, but it might not be. Um, increasingly important is who pays the electricity bill. Now, this is you know, electricity bills have tripled in the last six months and may double again. 
Um, and who's planting the trees to offset the carbon? Nobody seems to really worry about that, but, but I'm sure many of you have seen statistics about the huge amount of uh, carbon um, that is generated from, from data centers. And, and th that's just data centers. That's not including um, all the GPUs that are being put to work on these things. And lastly, is, it, is your problem really of that much interest? Uh, a lot of people still work on genre analysis, which I, I long ago decided was a fairly um, pointless exercise, um, since humans you know, assigned genre in the, in the first place. So is it an important problem? Do you want to spend your time on it? Or is it a toy example to explore? There is value in toy examples, of course, but not necessarily spending um, hours and hours of GPU time on them. So, my, my feeling is that there are all sorts of fallacies, um, lazy language and intellectual poverty in this current, in deep learning research as it currently stands today. Now, that's not to say that there aren't excellent people who are doing really top work, but um, they're, I think, in, in the minority. Uh, and as I said, I've tried to find some eye candy for, for and I, I, I think um, intellectual poverty was what I googled and I got this brilliant um, quote from Claude Levi-Strauss, I have never known so much naive conviction allied to greater intellectual poverty. I thought that was rather telling uh, for, for what I, not the message I'm trying to get across. But here's, here's one of the, the fallacies that cropped up really early um, in uh, applying deep learning to audio. It goes like this, and I've seen it many times. A spectrogram is an image, so if you use a, a convolutional neural network designed for images, you can understand music from a spectrogram. I mean, there's just so much wrong with that. Uh, it, it, it doesn't pay any attention to, to what an image actually means. It's, it's not only is it derogatory to what audio is about, but it kind of doesn't understand what images are about either. But that that one sort of sense has um, led to all sorts of uh, research papers. And it, it's testament to the power of these devices that they will still do something useful. Um, this bothers me, and I've managed to train at least one of my PhD students not to, to use the term handcrafted features because it's pejorative. It sound, you know, you are deliberately downplaying I don't know how many hundred years, but let's start with Monsieur Fourier. Um, you are downplaying all the mathematics that has, and all the engineering that's gone into these features by calling them handcrafted, which just doesn't seem to me to uh, be, be um, uh, to acknowledge the, uh, all the intellectual um, effort that's gone into creating the, those features. I much prefer the term engineered features. I think that, that makes sense. And like I say, one of my students now uses that, not all of them. Um, the fact that more data is better than less data, no matter the quality, well, that's just, you know, we all know garbage in, garbage out, but, but every generation seems to need to learn that again. Um, there's this concept of max pooling, which took me a long time to understand what that was, uh, but um, it's a very non-linear um, operation. Um, and uh, yeah, again, it seems to it seems to work quite well. But again, I, I believe that many people use that without really understanding what is meant by. It. I, I won't go into what it does mean. Um, uh, this idea of strides. Well, we all know what we all know what it is from because we understand what convolution is. But all of a sudden, a new term leaps into into common use without really uh, any any. Um, so. I guess I'm using this as a proxy for the fact that many concepts from signal processing, and I didn't say I'm a, my, my title is Professor of Signal Processing at Queen Mary, many concepts from signal processing are being renamed um, and used casually, I think, in, in, the, in the literature. Uh, strides is one of them. Uh, one by one convolution. I, one of my students wrote, I said, what, what does that mean? I, I don't know what that means. What it actually means is you take, well, I won't go into it, but it's not convolution. I looked it up on, I actually decided I better just check on this. I, I looked at it on the web, it wasn't Wikipedia, and it really did say something like, uh, this isn't convolution. It defined it and said it's not really convolution, because it isn't, it can't be. 
Um, and then this thing that I worry, one shot, few shot, one hot, and all sorts of little things like that. You, I typically have to guess what they mean. And I, I often wonder if, if the people who write these words know what it really means. Um, so what is happening and why? Um, so this is just my, my hypothesis here. Um, but uh, I can't remember how I found that image, but it was perfect. It's the blind leading the blind, isn't it? Or the blinded, blindfolded leading the blindfolded. So I said at the beginning that deep learning is very clearly a bandwagon. Um, employers want their recruits to know it because, well, in fact, the employers themselves quite often don't really, but they know it's the thing that they need their workforce to uh, to be competent at and to, to, to deploy in their products. And I've had PhD students who redid some experiments, uh, which, because, the, you know, they started maybe 2016 or 2014 or whatever it is. They redid the experiments or switched late on from non-deep learning to deep learning because they thought they couldn't get a job otherwise and probably they were right. Um, and there's the other, another really important aspect is that there's insufficient understanding of the inner mechanisms of these non-linear function approximators because that's what they are. They're, Mathematically, they, they are nonlinear and they approximate functions in one way or another. And this is encouraged by these very high functioning programming environments like PyTorch. And so researchers and developers plug and play with little deep understanding of what's going on. And I think that isn't necessarily as terrible as it sounds, um, but which I'll come back to. And also, I think this is fundamentally people like magic bullets. They want something that, you know, hey presto, it will solve my problem. I don't need to think about it, which is kind of um, depressing sometimes. Um, so data and lots of it, please. Um, I th this image I thought was great as well. I, I, I should have shaped my bullet points around those five aspects of consistency, accuracy, completeness, auditability, and orderliness, but I didn't. Um, so there seems to be a, a bit of a, an inter, interaction between the different sorts of uh, uh, the way that data is used for training, for validation, for test, and then deployment, which is sometimes called inference. Uh, how ecologically valid should the data be? Um, how close to the problem that you wish to de deploy it against should it be? And this is this has been very. I, I was hugely baffled by one of my PhD students, who. Uh, so this has been my, one of my my problems, and maybe for some of uh, you out there, uh, the, the youngsters jump. You know, I didn't learn this stuff as an undergraduate. Well, actually, I did. Strangely, we'll come back to that. Um, I didn't know I'd learnt it. Um, they seem to know more than you do, and so you have to go along with what what they say. So m quite a few researchers have generated test material for source separation by just taking different instruments that have no musical, that the, the sequence of notes they play have no musical connection at all. They sum them up to create a composite and then they separate them out as part of the training. Um, I, I just, you know, the, 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 the reasoning is for generalizability, but uh, it's not a problem that is real in music, so why would you do it? Like, we're starting to address that by actually creating data sets that, have, that can be large, that can be automatically generated, but actually are musically coherent. Um, representative quality, I'm going to just check the time, but I should probably move a bit quicker. Um, yes, yeah, so really. <laughs> The same, it's the same issue about eco ecological validity. Um, I mentioned this before about the quality of the ground truth annotations. You see in some papers that they, uh, there are processes for working out how much the different human annotators agree with one another and using that as part of the, the process, but it's not often practiced. And of course you can use, you can use the same procedure 
to, um, to, to quantify how good the machine annotator is. Uh, rating, the, like, rating the machine against the, the humans. This is uh, another concept that took me by surprise, data augmentation, which means take a small amount of data and use probably signal processing techniques to generate more data. It sounds like a good idea, uh, but I, I, I can't prove that it isn't a good idea, but my, I, I, my, my instinct tells me that if you take a sequence of notes and you pitch shift them, you haven't generated anything significantly different, and you you have added artifacts, of course. Uh, if you add white noise, that's not very realistic. Um, some people add MPEG artifacts, which is not a bad thing, perhaps. But um, again, it's it's a it's a technique that is being used in a kind of unknowing way. It's not done um, with with uh, full awareness of the implications. On the other hand, what is um, starting to happen much more uh, is careful synthesis of data sets um, and we've started doing some work on that you start with some midi uh, and some anechoic uh, instrument recordings and uh, using um, uh, high quality room synthesis techniques or, or real room impulse responses actually generate very hyper realistic um, but entirely um, entirely reliable and all the provenance is known um, data sets and so yeah, using physical modeling of instrument to room for example uh, so this is good in my opinion um, so oh can I still be heard yes good um, suddenly I was listening to I forget when it was to somebody giving a talk and I thought you know what this sounds to me like actually um, the process of psychology not that I know much about psychology uh, so I, I did uh, I spoke to a colleague who uh, is a psychologist and so I'm, I'm starting to try and think about how deep learning research is done from the perspective of psychology so I've called it first of all I thought of it as artificial psychology but more generally I think it's probably artificial neuroscience and this is where I get very you know, you can argue with me about this, I think, quite a lot. Um, so, um, how can I put that? I, th I don't think this bullet point expresses really what I want to say very well. Um, a large, a large quasi-thinking system is constructed and then uh, it is tested in, in a laboratory and its responses are measured and the statistical analysis of those responses are made. That seems to me like a, a psychology experiment. Unfortunately, none of the, none of the, um, uh, the regularization of, of psychologic, psychology research is brought into, the, into the, the issue here. So it's sort of amateur psychology. What I would be proposing essentially is bringing seriously bringing psychologists into the into the, the the world of deep learning, so that their methodologies are properly adopted rather than in a kind of uh, ad hoc amateuristic way. Uh, oh, I think I said that. Um, I'll come back to one of them anyway. So I, th I thought a little bit about well, what else is there in psychology? Um, or in neuroscience, and there's a there's a lot there's a body of work on what happens when you um, either remove part of the brain or you separate the two halves of the brain. I've, just for the sake of provocation, I've called it artificial lobotomy, but it turns out that actually um, people do these things called ablation studies. I had no idea what that was um, at first, uh, but it is in fact borrowed. It's a term that's borrowed from psychology. Um, and it's about removal of, the com of a component of an AI system. Well, actually, quite often, researchers remove some of the data, not the, com not, not the system itself. And it's supposed to be a test of the graceful degradation of the system, but it seems to me to be the opposite of how I've been trained as an engineer, which is you start with a simple system and you gradually increase the complexity, because that way you understand it. You understand how 
adding complexity uh, changes the behavior. So um, I, I guess what I'm saying is this artificial lobotomy is a bad thing, but it should be done uh, in, in a more um, developmental way. So what, what happens is try everything at once and then remove things and see how it changes. Well, you've really confused yourself right from the beginning by adding too many variables into the experiment. Um, so a few, so that led me to think, okay, if, if, um, if I've got this far with my thinking, let's look at some other uh, possible um, inspirations from neuroscience and what, what else can we do? So what about EEG, MEG and MRI? These all probe how the brain works under various stimuli. You're actually looking essentially at the mechanism. And how does this map onto deep learning? Well, actually, as far as I can tell, uh, linear algebra is the, the mechanism, is the tool here. And um, if, if any of you think, oh, that's interesting, what I would recommend, and the reason I'm, I've started thinking this way is I was uh, introduced to the online lectures of um, Gilbert Strang from MIT, who's an 80-year-old absolute magician at linear algebra, and a lecture course on uh, linear algebra and deep learning, which is fascinating and brilliant, and um, you know really help helps has helped me shape some of these ideas. So, can you appeal to linear algebra to calculate some kind of figures of merit for what's going on inside? The, the, the deep learning architecture. So here's a few thoughts. Can you calculate the eigenvalues, for example, and see it, how many of them are bigger than a certain threshold? Does the rank of the matrix, how does the rank of the matrix change as training evolves? Can we accelerate learning by fooling around inside these, putting probes inside, stimulating them as, as, as people have done with human brains or monkey brains, uh, electrodes to stimulate them? Um, Basically, what, can you, what, what tools of linear algebra can you bring to bear on the internal workings of uh, deep learning architectures? And then this whole concept, ecological validity, is a concept from psychology. So I, I think, again, we can, we can examine that. We can uh, think about how that actually plays into um, this research. Um, there's another concept uh, in psychology of cognitive development which is that learning does not happen uh, all in one go in humans, but, but, but that is how deep learning works, is you throw all the information at it in any order you want, from the most complicated to the least, all at once, and uh, let the machine sort that out. But there is, in fact, uh, a, an alternative to that that is used, which is called curriculum training, which actually starts from simpler, simpler ideas and moves on. So just a quick one, that this uh, deep neural surgery actually works. I forget exactly how I came across this. I think it was, yeah, I think uh, I, I, I found a tweet that mentioned this. Basically, it's a recent paper that actually does get inside a neural network um, that's already been trained, cut a few bits out, and then retrain it, and, and it, it learns how to compensate for errors. I, I won't go through that in the, in the interest of time. I also came across this, the slow AI movement. I thought, well, that's the one for me. Um, so some of, so in some cases it refers, I don't know how many people have read Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow, which talks about the two different mechanisms of human um, thinking, essentially, the sort of autonomic instant reaction and the slower, more considered reaction. Um, there is the this DAIR, there, um, which was founded by ex-Google employees, again, as a sort of response to uh, big tech and, and the approach that they were taking. Um, uh, and and their, their perspective is, is one of, if you like, ethics and so on in AI. One of them says in an interview, if it looks like a nail, hit it with a hammer. Uh, and if it doesn't, well, you know, just use the hammer anyway. Um, which I think says something about AI. And then they also have various issues around data quality and provenance, the legality. Should you actually be using the data you're using, particularly if you're Facebook or you're Google, who collect all sorts of data without us knowing? 
and then the issues around inclusivity and diversity, which maybe aren't so important in music and audio, but I don't think we should ignore them. We should make sure they're not so important in audio and music. Be clear that we, you know, that that, that we can, um, or, or make sure that we adjust our behaviour so that we are inclusive and diverse. Um, so I think I'm nearly finished. Actually, thank you. Need a coffee. Um, so th the last real topic for me is where does the human being come into this? So uh, there's a concept of agency, uh, human rights versus the machine. And this image, I'm sure you can understand, is is a sort of facial recognition image. Uh, and we there are plenty of examples of, of how um, people of colour are not well identified. Uh, using facial recognition technology because of the bias in the data, in the training. Um, so, but for me, uh, it's always been a question, how much should the machine do and how much should a human being do? Uh, should all the learning be done by the machine in the cyber physical system? Is, is, do we just put our feet up and wait for the answer? Or do we benefit in some way by having to learn how to drive a system to be part of the whole integrated um, uh, behavior and, and therefore endowing humans with agency. So a, an example I've taken from one of my own uh, researchers from a while back is in a vocal percussion system, does the system adapt to the human or does the human adapt to the system or is it somewhere in the middle between the two? Um, oh, Okay, I'm going to skip over this, actually. Um, so, my final slide. Uh, I think some of the things I'm, I'm sort of uh, proposing here are that AI research in general, but we're, we're, we're doing audio, so we, we can't necessarily tell everybody what to do. Um, but what does responsible AI in audio and web audio look like? Um, it needs to be understandable and interpretable, which then makes it controllable too. Uh, it should be green and ethical. Um, personally, I've been, my own research has been moving towards uh, not just data-driven AI, but also knowledge or data-driven deep learning, uh, but also knowledge-driven. Uh, so, what you, what you find is that if you build the physics knowledge that we've all known in acoustics for a hundred years or more into the architecture it makes it faster to train and smaller which means it's more easily deployable but also uses it's also greener essentially um, and i think some of the in order for, for deep learning to become um, essentially a commodity and in the, my previous slide i just uh, draw an analogy to op amps which you know once upon a time everybody designed their own with in individual transistors and then it became a commodity that you just plug and play um, you need to stand standardize the specification around these uh, so that everybody can understand and, and decide easily what uh, to do and I think more than anything for, for researchers anyway is to improve the scientific method to bring in mathematics, linear algebra, and also some learn some of the lessons from psychology, uh, and for example, um, employ uh, controlled experimentation, as in biology, using uh, controls where, where you have a null hypothesis and so on. Anyway, um, that's all I have to say. I'm sorry it took a little bit longer than than I had planned, but uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Do we have any questions or comments? Hi. Uh, first, thank you very much for, for the talk. I think uh, it was really, really um, inspiring and to see this kind of reflections are, are really, really important. Um, I was, I couldn't help thinking that um, all the things that you're mentioning, specifically about deep learning, they're not actually specific of deep learning, all the problems that uh, you mentioned. Uh, research 
uh, in disciplines like uh, music information, which you've always, always been a, bit, a little bit like this. Yes. Um, and for me, um, you know, it's, it's a bit about where's the limit between engineering and science and uh, when you try to analyze human, uh, so data about human behavior like music, you're actually doing social science. Well, if you want to do science, it's a social science. So I was wondering if you, uh, you've been talking about collaborating with uh, psychology, but actually, what do you think about, uh, you know, Hi, uh, thank you for the talk. That was very insightful. Um, so I have a question. It seems most of your criticism has to do with methodology and research of AI. So I was wondering what your opinion was on applications of machine learning for more for end user applications where 
the goal is not necessarily to produce an, an AI system that produces the most statistically accurate results, but just variations on some data that is just good enough for some end user applications. I think good enough is a, is a great phrase, actually. I, I think quite often um, we, we lose sight of um, how you know, the functionality of what is good enough because we're, we're focused on getting the best and actually uh, it's only the best by one kind of silly metric that, that doesn't stand up. So one of the things I, I say to my, to my students and other people is, okay, so um, theirs was 80% effective, whatever the measure is, maybe F1 or something, uh, and yours is 80.5, but have you looked at where your system fails? Because it, particularly in music, you know, uh, what is incorrect isn't, sorry, what is not correct isn't necessarily incorrect. It's only marginally not correct um, uh, because, of the, because of the close correspondence between, for example, different chords. So uh, then I think it's important to see how far away from the correct answer you are. And, and that doesn't happen. Um when people deploy products to me that's always been the problem with the research we do um we we, we do things that are or at least i have uh, uh, that have a, an end consumer in mind in the hundreds of thousands or millions or even more than that and that's the real experiment is how well it actually um, deploys in the population and we can't possibly test that but there are some things you can do such as pay attention to failure modes. Um, the, this concept of state-of-the-art being stated, so many papers say, and my, my work is state-of-the-art. Well, that, I, I made that comment, this week's state-of-the-art, because that does happen, and it's not important. What's important is to have done the research well uh, and to have examined... Uh, examine the, the outcomes from as many aspects as you can possibly manage. And, and I think that isn't happening. So you're absolutely right. Uh, my criticism is one of methodology. Yes. All right. Yes, thank you for that. That's really good. That, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Mark, thanks for a very interesting talk. I enjoyed it. Um, you were critical of using spectrograms um, and uh, CNN type image based techniques for their interpretation. And this is something I've wondered about too. I mean, there, there are some obvious things one might worry about. Um, you know, of course, you throw out phase information with the spectrogram, although one can argue you could recover a lot of it, so maybe that's not such a big deal. Maybe, you know, the, the dimensions mean different things. You know, you've got two spatial dimensions in an image mm -hmm. and a kind of invariance built in these rotations, you know, give you, you rotate an image, you get another image that's meaningful and something like that isn't true of a spectrogram. But anyway, so what is wrong with doing things this way? What, what is the criticism that you have? Uh, it's not, it, it was, as far as I could tell, not thoughtfully done. It was like, oh look, here's a technique. It, and I, I think I've seen it decades, uh, you know, for a long time. That that let's just take a technique that works in image processing. It happens a lot in image processing. Uh, that sort of tra transfer from image to, to sound um, is to take that without really thinking about why and what, 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 what aspects of of image analysis do carry over to a spectrogram representation of audio and which bits don't. So, for example, uh, quite often a three by three convolution kernel is used in images because it picks up an edge, right? But how meaningful is that in, in audio when really what you're looking for quite often is much longer features you're looking for straight line features that are either horizontal or vertical, typically, or you might be looking for what looks like a sinusoidal feature, which would be vibrato. 
So I, I just think that there's no... So uh, what came later was people would use slightly bigger windows that might be 13 by 3 instead of 3 by 3 that would be aiming to pick up the, the, the length of, of, a, of a transient in, in, the, in the frequency domain. But so it's the non-thinking nature, it's the blind following uh, that, that if it works for this, it must work for, for my area. And I think it, to an extent, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, it's, uh, it, it's not being proud enough, it's not quite the word I want, uh, of, of, our, of our area of expertise in audio and sort of saying, well, if it's good enough for image, it's got to be good enough for us because they're the guys that do the stuff right. And so there's a, you know, I've lost, I've lost the, the word in any language at all, but certainly in English, uh, for, for sort of saying, we, we, you know, we have to follow them because they do it right. I, I just think, you know, that there's all sorts of things at play here, but it's the blind following and adoption that I think troubled me. And... Um, yeah, there's, there are physical laws that govern how images are constructed uh, of, 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 of gravity, of, of shape, and of uh, opti optics. Um, none of those apply with spectrograms. So, that, you know, that there's a whole load of things that bother me. Anyway, I should happy to talk about that later.